And I'm Steve. Welcome to another Field Trip Friday. We're here at Loaf. This is a bakery. We're downtown Durham. We're super excited to be here. Y'all want to see what's inside? I know, I sure do. I do too. Let's, Let's go. go. Hey, Ron. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? It's good to see you again, Jenna. Great. So, can you tell me where we are? Well, you're in Loaf. And Loaf is a little retail um, and some wholesale, but a retail bake shop. We sell breads uh, and pastries that we make in house. Uh, to all of our friends and family in the community. Cool. Awesome. Let's take a look around. Yeah, let's take a look around. Please go. I would love to know a moment of curiosity for you. In your a life. moment of curiosity? Yes. Well, it's been more of a lifetime of curiosity. I don't think curiosity comes in just moments, do you? Um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I mean, or you just keep having moments. But, yeah. Um, I can't remember one moment that really got me interested in science in particular, but I remember the one, the, the time frame that cemented it for me. It was when I was on camping trips in high school. Uh, I went on camping trips and, and um, canoeing trips and things with my school all the way through. It was a really wonderful experience, but particularly in, in many cases, the biology teacher would be leading, or one of the leaders of the group. And we would be out either on a hillside or in a forest or on a lake. And this teacher always knew like some of the species uh, of, of birds and trees and things that were around and he knew the geology of stuff and I found it captivating and I gained this real both appreciation um, for what was around but appreciation that I didn't know much mm. about what I was inside mm -hmm. of the natural world around me so at that time it really coalesced and it made me want to learn more about that and so then I went on to study biology and I just I just kept learning mm. and so it just that that time of just seeing the natural world and being captivated by the natural world made me want to learn about it that's really and cool. so I've been doing that ever since even in the bakery cool thank you for sharing that thank you what kind of experiment are we doing today well today we're going to do an experiment with a, a slightly different kind of cookie dough that I made today normally in our cookies we have all the usual um, ingredients we've got butter and sugar and flour and most importantly, we have some baking soda for leavening. So to show you the effects of leavening, I made the very same cookie dough, but I didn't put any baking soda in it. So the only difference between our normal cookie dough that we usually bake every day and this one is that I just didn't put in the baking soda. So you used a word that I'm not sure if I know what that means. What does leavening mean? Oh, well, leavening just means lifting something up. So that could be a sourdough that you might have been making during the pandemic. Everyone's doing that. That's what's called a natural leavening. Um, chemical leavening is when you take a baking soda or baking powder, which is only slightly different from baking soda, and through a chemical reaction that creates a gas that then does the leavening. 
in both cases, you need a gas. One is just produced by the yeast in the sourdough culture, or in this case, by the chemical reaction going on inside the dough. That's really interesting. That's awesome. So what happens usually when some ingredients in a recipe, be it cookies or bread, that when they don't make it inside of the dough? And then what happens after you mix it or bake it? Well, if you forget an ingredient, which everyone does from time to time, hopefully as you get better at it, you just have those accidents less and less. Right. But um, if you forget to add an ingredient, then um, everything will change. It, it, the baking process and so many processes in life uh, rely on every aspect, every ingredient interacting with the other ingredient to make the finished product. So it's really hard to tell what will happen if you leave an ingredient out. But I know, for example, if we didn't add any flour at all, we would just have a, a puddle. It would just, there would be nothing to hold it together, just mm -hmm. like in a cake or a loaf of bread. It's the flour that holds this together. Um, if we didn't add the eggs, well, in this case, the eggs are the only source of liquid in there, so it would just be this greasy mass. And if we didn't have any butter, it'd be a tough, chunky, hard cake. But I couldn't predict exactly how everything would work, and that's the nature of an experiment. You don't yeah. know what's going to happen. So, See, what do you think awesome. is going to happen to our cookies that don't have baking soda? Well, I, I mean, honestly, I'm really curious to find out. I, I think that because Ron, being an experienced baker, has discussed this idea of kind of the leavening and the lifting, I expect we're going to see something that's less lifted, but I don't really know like what that means, you know, essentially. Like, like yeah. Ron said, like sometimes you have interactions that might not be what you expect. So I definitely expect that we won't get that kind of like puffiness of like, yeah. your typical cookie, but I, I don't know. I'm really curious. I think, yeah, if it, there's no gas to lift it up, it might just right now. Yeah. Let's find out. Let's find okay. out. Hey, let's go ahead. So here's the dough I made this this morning. Does it, do you think it would taste the same without baking soda? Um, not entirely. Baking soda actually has a slight flavor mm. um, it, from the, the, the sodium and the carbonate in it. But I'm just going to scoop a couple of, of balls of cookie dough. It certainly looks delicious. <laughs> I'm sure if you want to try it and taste it, you can go ahead. It's just regular cookie dough. So I'm only going to put two on this pan because our normal cookies are about this big anyway, and it would fit two. And we'll see uh, what will happen when we, when we bake these. That's We've got a little good. toaster oven here. That's good cookie dough. <laughs> Do you want to try it? Yeah. Get a little piece. I'm going to put these in there, and we'll get that going at approximately the same temperature that we bake the cookies in and the ovens downstairs that you saw before. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So we're on. While we're waiting for these uh, cookies to bake, I thought we could talk a little bit about chemical reactions. Okay. So, Steve, do you know how uh, we can tell if a chemical reaction has happened? Uh, so typically we look for changes, you know, and, and literally look for changes. A lot of times yeah. you can see things change. You can see, um, you know, like something bubble. You can see uh, some color like, change. Yeah, you can see the color of something change. Yeah. You can see um, something precipitate, which means to kind of like form a solid. Like if you have a liquid and you see stuff like start forming, like little flakes and stuff start yeah. forming. Mm -hmm. That's a precipitate. Something is yeah. precipitating out of your solution. So we got a gas forming. Mm -hmm. Uh, a solid forming in a liquid, mm -hmm. color change. Uh, sometimes you might see something, for example, like fire is a chemical reaction. Yeah, fire is a chemical reaction. <laughs> you might see something emit light, is mm -hmm. I guess where I was going with that, is it yeah. can get really bright. Yes. Or a sound. Yep. Or, or a sound. emitting an energy of some kind. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. And uh, cooking is for chemical reactions too. Right, well, I think we have all of, hopefully we don't have the fire today. <laughs> but we have all the rest going on in, in a cookie or a cake or a loaf of bread. You've got a volume change, you've got a smell being emitted, you've got color happening. Um, yeah, they, most of those things are visible. Some aren't, but yeah, yeah. most chemical reactions have some of them, right? So let, what do we, we have something oh, set up right yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So something um, I, was, I was hoping we could show folks is the way that um, the leavening agent that we're using, um, as, as Ron mentioned earlier, we're using uh, baking soda um, to uh, mix that with an acid. In this case, that acid is vinegar. And some of you have probably done this experiment. Yes. It's pretty classic, where you take the, the, the vinegar and the baking soda, and you're going to see that chemical reaction. But what I wanted to show is a little bit of the kind of change um, in, in, in matter. So um, the way that this produces a gas, but that that gas was originally part of what we had. So we're going to weigh this the whole time and see whether it changes its mass. So let's see what happens when we dump the balloon of baking soda into this vinegar. OK, I'll give it a try. 
Here it goes. Is this right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at that. And it's still 62 grams. Yes. So we're getting this massive change. Or massive. Massive. No, <laughs> pun, no pun intended there. We're getting this really big change in, in the matter, like in what's there. Like we now have this big balloon bubble on the side. Yes. But all of our mass is still the same. We're very, very, very close. Yes. Which I think is so cool. That carbon dioxide, that gas that was made from our chemical reaction, was within those components that we put in there. So that mm -hmm. carbon and oxygen was within the baking soda and vinegar, and we just kind of separated it out. Exactly. Right. Yep. Exactly right. We rearranged those particular out. Exactly. So let's take a look at these cookies. OK, well, it looks like I was wrong. Same. Interesting. Yeah. And Steve, I guess you were wrong, yeah, too. Absolutely. We both thought that we would get more spreading and less lifting. But it looks from our experiment like we actually got a little bit less lift, uh, spreading. Mm -hmm. So clearly, in this, um, in the cookies I normally bake, the baking soda that's in there bubbles up and actually helps the cookie spread a little bit more. And so it gets a little thinner and crisper the way that our customers like them, the way I like them. So that's kind of a happy accident. Yeah. Um, do you want to go ahead? Who doesn't like a warm cookie? Yeah. Oh, it's very warm, almost too warm to hold. <laughs> <laughs> well, One might say. Yes. I was going to break it open to see if it looked different uh -huh. on the inside. Well, if we take them off of the pan, yeah, they might also they might pull, 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 yeah. Like they will pull out. On but the I, I think this is a really great transition into asking one of our questions that we like to ask our guests, Ron, uh -huh. um, is how did you embrace failure one time in your life? Well, surprisingly, making these cookies was one of the, at most anyway, was one of our first failures that we had to embrace, or at least what I perceived as a failure, and I later learned that I was wrong. Um, I got this recipe from someone that I worked with uh, in catering, and I asked him if I could use this recipe when I opened my bakery, and he said yes. So I took a photograph of it. It was on, it was written on, handwritten on a wall. It was old and dusty, and it was a very well-loved recipe, like some of the recipes in your, in your cookbooks at home, with thumbprints and things. Mm -hmm. So I took a photograph and I brought it here to the bakery and I tried making these cookies again. And the cookies that he was making were the kind you'd get out of a bag or something. They were a little better than that, of course, but they were uniformly round and they were nice and tall and high and they looked like, you know, uh, just a, a, a cookie that we all, you know, would recognize. And I made them and I got what you see behind me. They were, they were spread out and they were uneven in shape and they were really thin, but, um, I later realized uh, that instead of having something terrible happen, I basically made a new cookie. And I loved how these cookies came out. So they were thinner and crisper, and the outsides got more caramel flavor because of the chemical change as they were baking. And so it turned out that instead of uh, looking at it as a failure to replicate somebody else's cookie, I had made something new and wonderful, and this became our famous now, a little pecan chocolate chip cookie. And so it's a, a very um, uh, a very new way to look at it. And I had to realize that instead of doing something wrong, I had simply done something different. And it wasn't wrong at all. It was just new. Yeah. I like that. So, That's so awesome. I like to call those things happy accidents. Yep. All right, let's see. If it... Well, Steve, you should probably open that bag and see what they look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, it would be awesome to compare the cookie. Compared to cookies. Already, it looks delicious. It's, I'm definitely going to eat this anyway. So here's, as Ron said, we, they spread really quite nicely. Uh, let's see the inside here. Yeah, I can do really side by side. This one's super cool. Oh yeah, mine didn't even make a noise when I broke it. It's so thin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely a thinner cookie. Yeah. Well, sometimes big changes don't look really obvious. Let's see how this one tastes. Let's see how this one tastes. <laughs> mm. It tastes good. <laughs> it tastes good. And I think that's the scientific part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, real good. Thank you, Ron. You're welcome. Thanks for having us, Ron. Really appreciate well, it. Well, it's really fun to have you here, and I hope things work well for the rest of your day. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Thanks, Ron. Awesome. Okay. Enjoy. Bye. Bye-bye.